Okay. That's recording. Okay. Great. So, uh, wrist injuries can often be very challenging. Um, and uh, I think that's usually the face I put when the patient says on the phone, you know, I've had wrist pain for about three months now and they're not sure what's going on and why they've got pain. Um, I think that's usually what I look like. Um, much like that as well, when they've had x-rays and nothing's broken or they give you one of those vague histories where it's, oh, I've got some wrist pain in my wrist somewhere. I can't really tell where. Um, and you just go, like, well, yeah, what now? What do I do? Um, so I don't know how clear that is if you're on a mobile or something, but, uh, but basically they break it up into the volo side, which is the palm side or the dorsal, the back end of the wrist. Um, and then radial, central, and ulnar sides. So just let me know which sides we're talking about. Um, and the surface anatomy is obviously really, really important. And that gives a good indication as to what might be going on um, and uh, what is causing the pain. So I know if you can see that, we'll obviously share the slides as well. Um, but that basically gives you a rundown of what we'll, we'll be going through. Like I said, I'm not a hand specialist. This is really just a dummy's guide and a, a quick tour of what wrist things we could be seeing. And then just a brief brush of some of the uh, injuries that you can have. Um, there's the volar side uh, um, with your flexor, carpi ulnaris, uh, and your tricretral arthritis and all those um, carpal bones. And there's just another way of looking at it um, with the sort of purple area being more of your decal veins and intersection syndrome, uh, your basal joint pathologies, uh, volar ganglia, your scaphoid fractures and so on. Um, the yellow area uh, being more the um, the ganglions, the carpal root boss, sensor tendinopathy, Kahnbox disease, scapulonate, interest ligament injuries, gout and inflammatory arthritis, and again, the blue um, and the green. And you can look at that again um, and keep referring back to that. So when you're on phone calls or video calls, you know, just gives you a bit more of a narrowing down of where. Um, where the pain is and what conditions might be associated with it. Uh, right, so let me know if this works on your side or if it doesn't work. So basically um, what he's doing is showing the inherent instability in the wrist, all right? So if you hold the distal radial ulnar joint um, and the first row of the carpal bones and moving it backwards and forwards or anterior and posterior like that. That's a normal wrist. Um, I think often when we do a test like that and you do it with patients, you move it that much and the patients think, oh, you know, there's something wrong here. That's the normal range of motion. And usually if it's not moving as much, there's something else happening there. Yeah. That there's some sort of muscle spasm or instability or arthritis or something's going on there. Um, so that's a normal, a normal wrist. So the first thing to go through is Decrovain syndrome. Uh, let me see if I can, there we go. Uh, so Decrovain syndrome, um, so that's pain over the um, so base of the thumb area. Um, Finkelstein's test, which I've got a video for, I'll show it just now. Um, it really does reproduce the patient's pain. Um, and when you do the test, I find a patient's often jump and they go, oh, yeah, yes, that's my pain. Um, it's a nice one doing over the phone or even over a video call. Um, and if it's positive, it's usually pretty good. Um, or you can be quite sure that that's the problem. Um, and uh, I kind of approach these just by treating it with 
normal tendon principles. Um, I often suggest bracing as well to offload the tendon and a lot of isometrics with um, elastic bands, rubber bands, holding it, um, the band around the fingers and the thumb and just holding that and then going into more movements as well. Um, just give me a sec. All right, so this should be the test. So basically it's the thumb in the palm of the hand, you close your fingers and pull to the ulnar side and showing you exactly where the pain will be right along there. Um, yeah, that's quite a simple one. Um, like I say, when it's positive, patients often jump up and down. And physios often have a lot of pain there as well. Um, with treating physios, if you're doing a lot of manual techniques, you often get a lot of that um, single steam positive test there for, for the deco veins. Um, right, so the next one is intersection syndrome, which is, as you can see in the picture, it's just a little bit more proximal and a little bit more central to the deco veins syndrome. And as you can see, um, it is the intersection of the extensor carpi radialis brevis and the extensor carpi radialis longus, um, where that crosses with the extensor brevis um, of the first finger and the abductor longus of the first finger as well. Okay. Uh, you can refer these on for an ultrasound or an MRI. Um, if I'm not sure between um, the you know, intersection syndrome or the echo veins might just give you a bit more information if you really want to be specific about it. But again, it's often treated much like your normal tendon pains. So I personally go with a lot of isometrics first and then going to slow movements and then quicker movements and so on. And there. Um, so that's the intersection syndrome, very similar to Decovane's syndrome. Uh, then the next one to just go through is the skateboard fracture. So it's all kind of in that same area of the wrist, greater part of the wrist. So that's uh, tenderness in the anatomical snuff box. So if you um, sort of go like you're going to hitchhike or thumbs up and you get that little snuff box in there, and if you push in the base of that area, it'll usually be quite tender. Um, I think most of us know these are often missed on initial x-ray. So if they're going to have a fall on to the wrist, they often miss these initially. And then on a follow-up x-ray, um, you often see that fracture. Um, and the big thing with these is because of its blood supply, you get a lot of avascular necrosis in it area. So it might be worthwhile if these are missed initially and not managed um, a few months later on, if you are concerned to definitely go and do an x-ray and refer on if needed, if uh, there is the um, avascular necrosis there. Um, and they can be really specific in terms of the distal fracture, the waist of the scaffold fracture, and then the proximal fracture as well. Um, so you can be really specific there, but that's um, basically pain in the anatomical snuff box um, and you get pain on palpation there. Um, uh, it's sensitive, but not very specific, that test. All right. Then more in the older population, base of the thumb arthritis. So um, remember what the tendons you're looking for, typical tendon type pattern of pain, this would be something slightly different, um, more so in the older population, perhaps uh, it's pain at the base of the thumb. Okay, so that's a little bit uh, further down. Um, uh, it can be aggravated by use. Again, difficulty opening jars and turning keys, but you have the same things with things like the veins as well. Um, a lot of stiffness in the thumb and change in appearance in the contour of the thumb. 
so you get that sort of more enlargement over that area. Um, and again, tenderness at the base of the thumb. Uh, so just to be thinking about that, don't just jump in anything um, going scaphoid fracture, decra veins, also be thinking about um, base of the thumb arthritis. These are all very, very close to each other types of injuries. Um, millimeters here makes a big difference in terms of what structure you could be on. And that's why these are especially difficult to do over the phone and even on video um, to really be specific in terms of what is going on there. Um, then uh, the skier's thumb or the ulnar collateral ligament injury of the thumb. Um, uh, yeah, so quite common in terms of that type of injury. So landing on the thumb going down like that. Um, I did actually get a picture of someone doing this, but it doesn't seem to be there. But um, so it's more common than the radial ligament um, and you go into a hyperabduction injury. Um, so the test with radial deviation, so it's basically uh, doing like a, a MCL or LCL sort of test of the knee, but then doing it in the thumb um, and doing it at full extension and then in 30 degrees uh, flexion as well. Um, and again, those I would often uh, go for some sort of splint or brace, especially in the initial phase. Um, I think that is something we could chat about afterwards is, is generally just about splinting and bracing. Um, I find a lot of people here are quite anti splints and braces, um, whereas where I trained in South Africa, um, a lot more pro bracing and splinting to enable function but with the view to trying to get them off that as quickly as possible. But I, I know some people have different views on that. Um, all right, so that's that more the base of the thumb, really specific um, mechanisms of injury there, which makes it a lot easier to be thinking about ligaments of the thumb. Uh, then the carpal boss uh, is a small immovable mass of, um, of a bone on back of the wrist, which is basically what you can see there. Um, whereas a ganglion is usually something that you can move and play with, uh, a carpal bus is, is immovable. So that's quite a hard piece there. Okay, not too much more to go into that. So pain around the area and so on. All right, so some of these more difficult ones. Uh, the scapho lunate Ligament tear is one of the most common wrist injuries. So uh, when it tears, it leads to the lunate extending and the scaphoid flexing. Um, and I actually have, I don't know if you can see that, I've actually done this. So my lunate is extending out and I don't know if you can see that little bump there. Um, so that's from a rugby injury um, and occasionally gives me a little bit of pain, but it's all right now. Um, Let's fall on to a wrist. Uh, um, most people usually leave it thinking it's just a fall on the wrist and it's probably going to get better. And then it comes on later. Um, and the test is a Watson test, which I couldn't uh, get a video of that to show. Um, but it is one with looking up and some people do it slightly differently. Um, mild ones, brace and rehab, more severe ones uh, need surgery. And they basically go and put a, a pin into that through the scaphoid and the lunate. I think sometimes it's actually three pins um, and just brace that area um, and allow it to heal and then remove the pins and then go through a whole rehab process. Uh, so, so that's the, oh, where's that? Uh, the scapho lunate ligament tear in there. So if people talk about spraining their wrist, it's usually that ligament they're referring to. Uh, next. Okay, so the next one is the lunotriquetal ligament. So it's less common than the scapho lunate 
ligament. Um, it causes for hyperextension and radial deviation. So more into full, more like that. Uh, the pain is slightly more on the ulnar side of the lunate. Um, you know, lots of special tests online and all sorts of fancy names and so on. And I think if you really want to get into it, uh, it's worth looking into. Um, but again, management is basically bracing and rehabbing. And bearing in mind that these types of wrist injuries take three to six months of conservative treatment to to recover uh, so they're not quick ligament you know like six weeks you know, these are expecting them to take that a little bit longer all right so this is one that name i don't know i have to go and look this one up kind box disease so it's a vascular necrosis of the lunate um, so it's dorsal wrist pain, um, decreased flexion and extension range of motion. It's pain over the lunate area. Makes sense with the avascular necrosis. Um, X-rays, you want to have maybe in a lateral and oblique views. Um, this is obviously a CT scan and you can quite clearly see that bone is uh, not doing very well in that avascular process. So that's called kind box disease. Then the dredge injury, so the distal radio ulna joint instability is the articulation between the ulna head and the ulna notch of the radius, um, often referred to as the sigmoid notch, I think it is. Um, so you can get various injuries here, which can include the ulnar styloid and distal ulnar fractures, TFCC injuries, uh, the ulnar impaction syndrome, uh, and then some fractures. In, uh, uh, with these, the pain is usually more dorsal and, and there is instability in the wrist as well. So the ulnar impaction or the, with the TFCC injuries is ulnar side of wrist pain now. Um, a positive ulnar variant, which is when the, uh, excuse me, the ulna is slightly increased in length relative to the radius, which means that the TFCC is under stretch and thin. Um, these can be insidious and progressive. Um, so they'll talk about uh, slowly developing this wrist pain um, on, the, on the side. Um, this decreased range of motion just generally, and especially in flexion and rotation as well. Um, the tenderness over the area distal to the ulna head and bola to the ulna styloid. So try and make sense of that in your head. Um, that's where that is. So this is one of the tests for it. So you grab the wrist like that with the one hand, and then you're going to ulnar deviate it. Once you grip the ulnar there, you're going to deviate wrist, and then you move at AP motion, and you feel that movement, and then you're going to go more into neutral rated deviation and do the same thing and test for the amount of movement that you still get. There we go. So then you radially deviate the wrist and moving it forward and backward. Um, and if the TFCC is damaged, you'll still have the same amount of movement. Um, if it's intact, it will hold and it will reduce the amount of movement there because it's actually stabilizing it. Um, next. So this is something I got off uh, physiopedia just in terms of different injuries, signs and symptoms, and then various tests. And there's a whole bunch of tests you can go through, some with nice fancy names. Um, 
if you can go and look at a lot of those. So you go through the TIF, CC injury, the you know, tricuitral intraus ligament injuries and so on. And then there's the kind box disease, ulnar nerve entrapment as well, which is then getting the first teaser on the fourth and the fifth digits. Um, ulnar artery thrombosis uh, and all of those. So you can keep that with you as like a reference guide if you need until it becomes more familiar. Uh, and then this is one that's quite interesting. So it's a painful snapping of the wrist with twisting motion. But patients will often say it feels like it's dislocating or something's clicking or flicking. So basically, you've got that little ligament there that holds the tendon down. And then when you rotate, it pops up and flicks. And then it comes back in when you go back. Um, uh, I've got a cool video of that one. So, yeah, we put the patient's wrist into flexion and rotate backwards and forwards, and you can see the uh, tendon there. And then it'll cut to a video of someone who's got a positive one. I'm sure you've seen this before. Uh, if you watch close, you can see it just flicking over there. Um, so that's more of an instability there. Uh, so if if that does flick, um, if it's not painful, it's not usually something to worry about too much. But eventually, if it starts clicking enough, it can become painful. Then this is the extensor carpi ulnaris tendinopathy. So a test for it: basically, hands together and then extending the wrist back and getting that pain down the ulnar side of the wrist there. Um, <clears throat> you can see, and that's a nice test again, sort of do over the phone um, or in video, I'm just asking the patient to put the thumbs together and extending the wrist back and then getting the pain down there. Uh, and I thought that was going to take me a lot longer to go through, so I thought I would go through the volar surface next time. But that's 28 minutes past. So yeah, that's a quick run through of uh, wrist injuries. I uh, hope that uh, just brings a little bit of clarity. I will share the presentation. You can go through that um, and just help have a little bit more clarity in terms of um, wrist injuries and so on. Yeah, anybody got any? Questions or want to discuss bracing, rehab options, things like that. Katie, are you for bracing or against bracing? Hey. Are you for bracing or against bracing? Or, or bracing? I would say it's um, for some patients quite important in the first instance. I found that wrists can be quite sensitive areas. Um, and yeah, bracing can be quite helpful to reduce their pain um, so that they're out of that acute phase and then start a rehabilitation afterwards. So yeah, I would brace. Definitely, definitely useful with hypermobility. Um, it's, there's also some good evidence for splinting with carpal tunnel syndrome. So a carpal tunnel splint for 12 weeks is strongly recommended for, um, for carpal tunnel syndrome. They sleep with the splint at night. And there's about, I think it's about a 40% success rate using a splint at night for 12 weeks. Um, and combined with, you know, with a manual therapy approach, with a electrotherapy, with exercise therapy and splinting and offloading, I think can be really, really useful. Um, and bracing can be super useful in hypermobility, especially if people have to keep on working. So it just provides some extra support to the pain settles. Um, I'll tell you a story. Um, a couple of years ago, came me and the kids went to Thailand and um, it, I um, was on a boat. We were going on a boat somewhere and, um, and I stepped off from the boat to the, to the jetty and the guy who was very helpful grabbed my wrist just to support me as I stepped off the boat. I'll tell you, I had wrist pain for about six months. 
it was insane yeah. and like he just grabbed my wrist you know and yeah I don't know what he did I mean it was probably like a tiny ligament sprain or something but wrist pain was, I knew for six months like it hurt so I, I strapped it up when I worked and it just gave maybe because I was using manual therapy but it just take ages to get better there's mm. such a pain mm. yeah. yeah I found so as well they yeah, often find it's like moms picking up children or nursery school teachers yeah. often picking up children or cooks um, and not being able to lift up, you know, parts for children um, because of the pain. And I think a brace will often just enable them to be able to do those things um, and just decrease the pressure on risk. Yeah, Tim, to, um, to be honest, you're just too weak. You're just too weak. I'm just kidding. <laughs> too hypermobile. <laughs> well, well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, very hypermobile. Yeah, I mean, I mean, bracing, bracing is spot on for carpal tunnel and stuff. I mean, you know, 90% of the symptoms go away just with just with splinting overnight, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. Spot on. On yeah. quite when I found very useful the taping. Taping. Yeah. yeah. So I always yeah. tape on the pain direction mm. and the patient is uh, uh, able to use the wrist as normal with less pain. Yeah. Yeah, I used to do a lot of wrist taping with um, rugby players and, and then even being able to limit the supination and pronation by going around the wrist it can limit the pronation and supination. A lot of thumb strapping as well um, especially the guys that couldn't catch the ball we we're trying to strap between the fingers so they're not joking um uh, yeah trap the taping definitely very very useful um i think if it's going to be a long-term thing i often say that the bracing is better um than the tape because of the skin um but yeah definitely taping k-tape works nicely as well on, on wrists, a little bit easier on the skin. I also had a couple of patients with uh, wrist pain, uh, insidious, uh, no injury, and the um, testing on the muscle chain uh, was the rhomboid uh, fault. Yeah, I had a patient with two years of pain in the wrist. Um, activating the rhomboid and then give it uh, more uh, chain isometric uh, exercises for the hand actually resolved the problem. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, it's often that type of history where it's nothing's, they haven't done anything, they don't remember doing anything, everything's normal. Um, the other thing I wanted to sort of mention is I've heard of a lot of people using these vertical mouse now um, at home and working with like a joystick mouse. So they're using a mouse like this and giving them just a horrible decrovades thing there. They think, oh, it's more economic, ergonomical and so on. And they're using these vertical mouse um, and actually causing themselves a, a tendon off the feet. Um, so I've had a few people asking about those. My view is is rather keep it in that neutral position. Or if you are wanting to change, then do it slowly. You have to bring it in like an hour a day or two hours a day and slowly phase it in if you really want to use it. Because to go from using a normal mouse or a trackpad to a vertical mouse is just such a new load. Um, and because it's such a fine motor control as well, um it's uh it's a tricky one yeah. Chris, I, I, yeah. i'm not sure if you've sorry if i'm not sure if you've heard of the guy in tunnel syndrome yep you've heard of that yeah the more, mainly seen in, in uh, cyclists uh especially in the uk as well you know so many cyclists i mean it's a, it, we, we, they don't really come up straight away because the symptoms fade off easily once they stop cycling but it's mainly the uh the little finger and the and the ring finger it's mainly affected by guy's tunnel right now compared to the carpal tunnel and uh, yeah splinting those as well are very effective 
Yeah, is that, isn't that Alan? Is that when you're um, typically on particularly uneven roads and you 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 have the, it's the constant the vibration. The, um, the, the the paresthesia through the fingers, doesn't it? That's right. Yeah, yeah. The repetitive vibration can cause that. Yeah. Yeah. It can also be from like tilt down handlebars when you're on uh, road bikes and like when people aren't proper properly using their abdominals when they're cycling and like holding their own weight and dumping too much load through the handlebars. So I often find doing a little bit of like core strengthening and activation can be helpful and just getting them to like really have a play around with the height of the handlebars helps with that. Absolutely. Yeah, a lot of people just pushing right on to the handlebars, just so taking all of the weight there and not actually sitting on, on the saddle. Yeah. Yeah. You can get a cyclist fun as well which is, I think it's like a tendinopathy of the thumb, isn't it? Again, from overgripping and being on uneven ground. Yeah. White yeah. knuckling it. Yeah. I'm only saying this from experience. After the um, Commonwealth Games in 2014, I decided to cycle back from Glasgow because I thought it'd be a good idea. I had my bike up there so I could get to work. So I cycled back from Glasgow. And I'm telling you, after about two days, my hands were literally going numb because I was gripping on this. This, this, but these bumpy sort of roads, the terrible roads, that's unbelievable. It just makes your fingers and thumbs go numb. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. And I have been with for a year. <laughs> oh. Thanks. Good stuff. Good stuff. All right, guys. Thank you, Chris, so much. That's been brilliant as always. Hope that helps. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Chris. Thank you. Chris. Anyone want to do the next one in two weeks' time? It's when, oh, when is two weeks? Uh, actually, two weeks. Yeah, two weeks. Twenty seconds. We do a little Christmas, a Christmas, um, a Christmas CPD. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah I'll be happy to do it. Yeah, anyone's doing it. Sorry. Go for it, Alan. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Any topic, yeah. Anything I think it should be like a pub quiz or something, but something fun. Yeah, you want to do a quiz? That would be fun. Well, we might we might organise something with, with the team for like get everybody together at some point. So um, we'll we'll talk about it over next week or so, Alan. All right, great to see you all. Have a great cool. evening. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Bye. Thank you, guys. Bye. Thank you, Chris. Bye. Bye. See you guys. See you guys. Thank you. Bye bye. bye. Hey Chris, um, hey. do you mind um, sending me a recording? I will do that. Must yeah. I do that we transfer again? Is that the best way? Yeah, that's brilliant. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Cool. All right.